Matthew chapter 11. And I read from verse 25 that says that at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and the earth, about you have not hidden these things, or you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, and revealed them unto me. Then he says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and let of me, and you shall find the rest in uh, your souls. Now I want to read it from a translation called uh, the Message Translation, because this will uh, um, zero in on what I want to share this morning. Now it says, abruptly Jesus broke into prayer and said, Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and the earth, you've concealed your ways from the sophisticated and know it all. But you have spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. And he said, the Father has given me all these things to do and to see. This is a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. So Jesus said, I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone that is willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. And learn the unforced readings of grace. Jesus said, I want to teach you the unforced readings of grace. That is any man worn out and tired, even in his religious life, that if he is willing to listen, I will go line by line with every single person on every subject matter. And that is what the Father taught me as a son in all of this, that I am now willing to communicate and to share, and it says, you shall find the rest in your soul, or in your life and in your labor, you will enter into the unforced rhythms of grace, which means that things will come out in your life in an unforced manner, and you will flow with the rhythms of grace that are already at work in this life. Then look at Matthew chapter 7. If we read from chapter 6 and verse 25, it says, Therefore I say unto you, you don't worry about anything. Well, the point I want us to look at where I'm going this morning is what it says in 7.7. 7. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened up unto you. Then Jesus said, for everyone that asks, receives. Now you can underline that and say categorically, every single person that fulfills this condition of asking, receives. Everyone that now goes for that to seek, will find. And then everyone that knocks, the door shall be opened. And it says, or what man is there among you 
who his son will ask for bread, and he will give him a stone. Ask for a fish, and he will give him a serpent. If then ye being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more won't your heavenly Father, or your Father that is in heaven, give good things unto those that ask him? Then he says, Therefore, whatsoever you want that men shall do unto you, he says the same, do unto them. Now, if I go on with this, about every single one that asks will receive, and every single person that seeks will find, and every single person that knocks, the door will be opened up unto that individual. Where Jesus says, if you ask, you are going to receive. And when you have received it, you will seek for it, and you will find what you have received. And when you find what you have received, then you will knock on the door, and the door shall be opened up unto you. So there is a place of you praying, and then receiving in prayer. Then there is a place of you seeking out in everyday life the opportunity for the fulfillment of what you have received, and you are going to find it. And then as you enter into that opportunity, you have got to be persistent in terms of you knocking there and keep knocking until that door is opened up unto you. Which means that at the very end of this manifestation to answer prayer, I will see the entire process, you have to knock. You have to demonstrate persistence in life. You have to be able to stand there and because you have received it and you have found it, you will persist and stay there and say that, you know, this thing is actually going to happen. And let me just drop something here, <coughs> excuse me, about persistence and about knocking. Because a lot of people in life don't even think because they have prayed and they have received, they have sought and they have found that knocking somewhere is not part and parcel of it. That persistence is not part and parcel of it. And therefore, in, uh, you know, sheer arrogance, so to speak, to life, they are not persistent individuals. And then again, some people lose out again on what God will do for them in the future because they feel that they've arrived at a place that they are too big in life to knock on the doors of life. I remember that when we were editing the uh, platform programs, I was listening to um, um, a part of Tony Cole's message, and he said something, and I said, this is very powerful. I mean, this is an executive director of one of the largest indigenous oil companies in this country. And he said that he went to Angola. You know, people don't think that, and don't know what it takes for people to succeed in life. Most people are just passive and lazy when it comes to the issue of prayer, and they don't understand that you have to knock on the door of life that you have to stand there, and because you believe you have received, you demonstrate your faith by knocking on the door of life. And he was saying that he went to Angola, and when he got to Angola, that, you know, he brought his Nigerian passport, and they told him to stand aside and sit there for five hours. Now, any big man and any arrogant person, you are not going to subject yourself to such things. Which means, how can I come to this country? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I have? You are telling me to sit down. And that was how they started out because he said they wanted to expand their business opportunities in other countries. And entering into another country, that is how they had to start out. By them telling him, they put everything aside, stood there for, and sat down for five hours, waiting on immigration officials and all of that, until they finally said, you can go. And that shows that you are ready, you are hungry, you are persistent, you are knocking on the door of life. There are many people that go through those kind of experiences, and because they don't understand how things happen in life, they will simply get discouraged and say, for this to have happened, for this door to have been opened up by God, then there should be no adversity, there should be no opposition, there should be absolutely nothing. I should just stroll through things in life, or they have this complex of becoming that I'm now a big man, I cannot do certain things. And because they have put themselves on that pedestal, they miss out on the next wave or the greater things that God wants to do within their life. I was listening to, you know, the former speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States, and he wrote a book, The Five Principles of Success in Life. And the um, journalist asked his daughter, because he wrote with his daughter, 
and say that, can you tell me, I just want to ask you now, off the top of here, I just want to ask you here, what is one thing you learned from your father while growing up, let's put the book aside, that was a key to his success in life? And she said, I remember when I was six years old, and he went to go and contest, this was a man that eventually became the Speaker of the House of Representatives in America, but she said, I remember the first time, the second time I went for a lecture, we lost the second time. And I noticed something my father did, and she said he was persistent in the midst of apparent failure. That I remember that after we had labored and worked and done all of that, and the result came out and we lost, that the next morning he woke up and woke us all up and said, let us go back into the Ford factories where we can paint. And that he walked through the factory and greeted everybody that helped him. I said, thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all of you. I'll be back in two years' time to ask for your vote again. Now, this man now won two years after, eventually became the speaker, but you could see that in the midst of apparent failure and defeat, he was knocking on the door of life. You understand what I'm saying? Now, there are many people who will say that if God is there, if God is helping me, you know, if God is there with me, you understand this? I can't persist. I can't keep knocking on the door of life. They don't understand the role and the place of persistence. They don't understand who see it, that when you find things, uh, that are answers to your prayer, you'll find them many times in the low places of life. You'll find the opportunity for your next breakthrough in places that are lower than the place where you really are, and that's why you must have a mentality no matter how much you are moving ahead. I mean, I was telling people in the office, when we, when we started using our studio, I mean, we spent millions in the studio we have now, which is very modern studio, but of course also about 10 minutes, I said, listen, four years ago when we were going to start on television, I will get up here in this office here, at 9 o'clock p.m. because that was the only time I had for me to edit. And I would go to Moshe and sit down with who the Moshe that was there that was teaching me editing and all of that. I would be editing all those programs that are coming out. It was in Moshe. And when I came out of the place, I would wait till I didn't know see on television. I would see the coming out of face and I face you, the building and all of that. And I said, you know, Pastor, what are you doing here? That was where I started. If I was too big, that program would never come on here. Are you following what I'm saying here? Sometimes when the man will tell me I don't have time, I will have to sleep in my office, get up at 5 a.m., wake them up. They will all be sleeping on the floor, wake them up. They'll say, Pastor, you have come. And then I will sit down. But then they taught me tricks about editing. Those young guys showed me the secret to it, how to add sound and things. At times I will go to the studio and I will tell them, when you have problems, do it like this. They say, Pastor, where do you learn it? I said, I was an apprentice. I then start with English and all this thing. They were, you know, when you talk about when you learn printing and you you are not using um, all these um, um, computer generated things, you cut and paste. You understand? Saying that you're a printer, you understand? You cut and paste. You go and do you know all of that. I said that is how I learned how to edit. So there are some tricks that we know when they will teach you that doing like this, doing like this, that you can add certain things and all of that. But you see, people don't want to work on the door of life. Now, even what I'm saying. That, they feel that if I find something, an opportunity, we should just throw through the park. And that's why many times they miss out on it. So we are talking about asking, and it says everyone that asks. I'm going to show you what you ask for, that Jesus said that everybody that asks for this will get it. And that once you get it, you will know that you have gotten it. Then you will go out in life, in practice now, and seek for it. Because once you have received it, seek for it, you will find the opportunity for the fulfillment of what you have gotten in your environment. When you find it, that's why God said in Isaiah, who is as blind as my messenger, as deaf as my servant. Seeing many things, which means there are prayers that have been answered that people don't know that they have to seek for those answers in their environment. And like we said last week, if they will feel after him, they will find him because he's not far away from every one of us. For in him we live, we move, and have our beings. And then after you find it, and you find it in those low places, the same way Jesus, the great one, was born in a manger. And you find the manifestation to that prayer in that particular manger. Then you will stay there and you will knock until a massive door has not been opened up unto you. And then people will see you at the other side and will wonder at reasons and, you know, have all this happened. But this is the pattern that you have got to follow as an individual in life. But then it drops one thing here that I want us to see, 
about a definite law when it comes to working with God and entering into this unforced rhythms of rhythms. It says before we talk about asking and we talk about receiving and we talk about seeking and we talk about finding and we talk about knocking and the door being opened up unto you. He said, I want to show you a law and he says there that it is this. This is all that the law and the prophets were speaking about. That whatsoever you want men to do unto you, the same do unto them. Which means the way God is going to manifest himself to you is going to be dependent on the way in which you treat people. That's why he tells us, Father, forgive all. He says when you pray, you pray and say, Father, forgive me my trespasses as I forgive those that trespass against me. Which is the law is that God will do unto you as you do unto others. So whatever you kneel down and you want to start praying to God about, understand the basis of your transaction. That you are going to you are going to have results according to the way and manner in which you as a person are treating other people. So before you start praying, God does something. He makes a provision for the answer to your prayer. And what he does is that he brings people who are in need alongside you. If you look into an environment well, you will find out that there are people with pockets of need that are around you. You will find out that this is what God does. Second Corinthians, you don't have to go there, just quickly read it to your own reading the message transition. So you can go back and read it, but then just read it to go in Second Corinthians. Yeah. Uh, I saw this here. It says in Second Corinthians, when it says, Blessed be God our Father, who comforts us in all that tribulation. The message translation says, All praise to God, the Father of our Master Jesus, the Father of all mercy, God of healing counsel, who comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just that God is there for us. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why you see that Job. When he turned around, was going to come, God brought somebody alongside. And when he didn't focus just on himself, but focused on the other people, God turned his captivity around. Joseph, when he was there in jail, God brought somebody alongside for him to help. That's the secret to your manifestation. And the minute he helped that person, from there, his own was triggered. Study Abraham. Abraham was saying, we need a child, sale and all of that. Suddenly, God brought Abimelech alongside, who was in need. All the wounds were closed. If Abraham was just focusing on God, you might be what I want to get from you. He would have missed out on it. So what am I saying to you? This is a law. God will bring the people alongside you at every given time in your life. And the law is he that goeth forth bearing precious seed shall doubtless return, which means without a shadow of doubt. It says, for God, when God turned our captivity, we were like them that bread. So if there's going to be a turn around, precious seed has to go forth. That's why the widow at Zarephath, God brought somebody else alongside her that was in need. And if you help him, you are going to get help. So watch your environment well. The platform of manifestation is based on this. God will bring people alongside you. Some of them might even behave badly, but focus on what God has provided. Because the enemy knows that if this people can curse you, then you will stop blessing them. So he says, bless them that curse you. If a madman comes around you, he is carrying your blessing. You are something here. He says, pray for them that despitefully use you. So long as they need, pray for them. He says that do good to them that do what hates you. So be sensitive to what's going on in your environment. I will say this as God and watch. That God will bring people alongside, and so many people are concentrating on the fact that I don't have and I'm in need. But let's remember that the Bible says, To him that has shall not be given, and to him that has not, even that which he has shall be taken away. So the law is both of them had one was conscious of the fact that he had, one was conscious of the fact that he did not have. 
But they had the same thing. It says the liberal soul shall be made what? Fat. Which means it was liberal and mean. But then when he started being liberal, then he started becoming fat. So giving is an essential part of this. So I want to look at asking. And I want to show you today. What is it that you ask for as an individual that you will always get? And once you get it, you can now seek for it. And you have to seek for it. And then find it in your environment. And then when you find it in your environment, you must now knock on that particular door. Yes, a friend of mine, friend, not to mean friend, friend like that, but you know, she, she used to be in a church. Um, that is supposed to be that I'm pretty sure it's deported or something to her country. Home where she sent me a text, and then I said something in the text. I can't remember exactly what I said. She, I think she was in a seminar, she was organizing a seminar. You know, she used to be worshiping me like my church. So the guy said, so she said something there about you coming to Congo for a seminar. And I said, what, what do you mean? Um, okay, she sent me a text. I said, who is this? She said, who else do you know in Congo? You know? So I just joked about it because I didn't know the number said 240. I asked somebody, I said, what 240? Which country is that? So I joked about that. I know people in Congo. Ah, that's okay. Ah, they're even waiting for you to come and do a seminar. Now, what I'm telling you is that this is how small things, things start. But I want to show you how to know what to do. All right? I want to show you this. Now, so it says ask. Now, if you follow this, you that's why Jesus said, if you listen, I will show you the unconscious of what we need to fix. If you are willing, if you go this way. Look at Matthew chapter 6 here. And the real problem, let me just tell you this. Faith message was very good, confession was very good. And let me tell you the problem here. The real problem. I found it this morning. I've been thinking about it for years. And I saw it clear. The real issue is that people, the many people that took up the faith message, felt that they have now found a formula through which what they wanted will happen in life. And therefore, they became very self made That's why when you meet a typical word based faith person, except the person has gone through crisis. Whereby they depended on certain things. They are one of the most stubborn, rebellious people that you ever meet. They have no appreciation for the cross. Once the message tells them that your agenda might not come to pass, that is it. They are powerful about saying it, they talk about declaring it, talk about all those things. It sounds very well, but at the base of it, is one farmer resoluteness that I am using this to seek my own personal agenda and I've now found that the reason why I've stayed with this message is that it has shown me a way to get my own things done. Where if you say anything about the cross and the reason why that couldn't work was that listen, many of them couldn't cross into ministry is that God had to call you into ministry for it to work. And before God calls you into ministry, a man will send you on errands. You must do what a man will tell you to do before God comes to tell you to do something. And because they couldn't listen to anybody tell them to do anything, they were cut off from their bodies. That's the answer. When God came to me and which I said, listen, at this stage of your life, you do what you are told to do. You don't do what you think. You have not reached that stage. Jesus himself did what his parents said until God came to meet him. That's why he put Moses on that, uh, the Jethro, and he was doing what Jethro said until God came to call him. You understand what I'm saying? And if you cannot do Paul and Barnabas who are doing what they were told until God said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I call them. If you cannot do what you are told, then you will never be in a position to hear anything from God. I saw that young man and I said, let me tell you something about Pastor Lee he said this. And this is his greatest secret to why he exploded and became so powerful in ministry. He said, I started as my translator to the pastor and the Jew of the day. He said, and he will preach in your bar and I will translate. Listen to what he said. That this is very powerful. He said that the time came that the man said, all right, this is what will happen. You will start preaching, I will start translating. Because the man probably felt he will appeal to a greater audience if you preach English, I translate in your bar. Instead of me preaching your bar, you translate it into English. Then he told him, go and go and write your sermon. Then he will bring the sermon. And the man will correct 
in the psalm and say, say it like this, and give it to him. And then he will carry it and say it as the man said. Are you following me? Then the man will translate. Then the time came that the man said, look at all his sermons and couldn't correct. When he couldn't correct it for two months, he said he would be the next Jew. As you say what I'm saying. But when you can't allow someone to correct your sermon, that thing you didn't allow them to correct is what will destroy you when you open your mouth. Are you following what I'm saying? I was in a fellowship where they told me, you don't say this on the pulpit. You understand what we're saying? You say, yes, sir. That's where we started. Or else your revelation will confuse you. Now, are you following what I'm saying? When you tell somebody, don't say that. I might say, listen, I know what I'm telling you. Just leave the person. Cannot make it. God in heaven will close his ears to the prayer of the person. He said he gave grace to the humble and he resists. Are you following what I'm saying? That's why there are many people in business that they have no vision because nobody, I look, there are people even in church. When they start giving problems, I look at into their background and I know they've never worked on anybody, even in secular life. They will not those things, they don't they don't behave like that. You understand this? And it's not a church issue. If you go back to their families, ask their father. The father will say, that's how he was disobedient to Israel. And the only way that God can do it is to get you through crisis. And even after the crisis, you say, I shall agree. I will continue. <laughs> I am for the way, because I'm telling you this message. So it says here in Matthew 6 here. Now, from verse 25, I want to say something about the kingdom. From verse 24. Now I'm reading from message because this passage makes it clear. So that one by you can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you will end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money together. Now, if you decide for God, which is a you know. Do you hear what I said? If you decide for God, this is how your life goes. I know everybody says I'm with God. You know. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at meal time or whether the clo clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you are putting in your stomach. More to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God, and you count far more to him than birds. Has anyone by forcing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes much difference? Do you think it makes much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never print or show, but have you ever seen color and design quite like this? The 10 best dressed men and women in your country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildfires and uh, wildflowers, most of which are never even seen. You understand what I'm saying? Most of what God is doing, nobody will ever see them. So he's not doing it as show off. He's doing it because this is how he is. Everything he does is with a touch of excellence and perfection. You understand this? So if you decide for him, this is the person you are deciding for. It says, don't you think 
he'll attend to you, take pride in you, and do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, not to be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to what God is giving. Do you hear that? It says you are so preoccupied with getting that you are not responding to what God is giving. Which means what God is giving is not what you are praying.